see, people got to understand, like, when you mess up, you can't just, like, seek forgiveness, but you have to atone. That means doing something to, like, tip the scale tip that scale back to good. You know what I'm saying? Don't just like, yeah, I'm sorry, I messed up. Right. I don't like sorries. I don't like apologies. Right. Because people just get, they give them out too freely and it means nothing. Mm -hmm. Do something. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the From Boys to Men show brought to you by the Squire Program. I'm your host, Layden Cook. And today, I got a really, really special guest with me today. This is somebody that, even though I, I just met him in person a couple months ago, uh, I've watched him for years and somebody that's been a mentor to me for a long time um, via just watching his videos on the internet, on YouTube. And so it's, it's a special moment for me to have him here with us today. Draw some serious game. Mr. Mike Rashid, how you doing, man? I'm excellent. Thank you, man. And I really appreciate you um, for tapping in for so long. Yeah. And I'm glad that you've, you know, found some value in the stuff that I put out. So that. That's a good, that's a good look. hundred percent, man. No, I'm just, this is a really awesome moment for me too, man. So I appreciate you coming out. Um, obviously you got a lot of stuff going on right now. So this means a lot and obviously shows, uh, your, your character as a man, the, the fact that you said, Hey, I gave you my word. I'm going to be here. And so this means a lot to us and the team and, and obviously to the viewers as well. So thanks. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, um, most people know who you are, right? This is going to be a big headline for people to just click it because they want to see who, who you are, more of your story. But for the few people that don't know who Mike Rashid is, Give us a little introduction. Oh, man. Uh, Mike Rashid, it's funny because I don't like to say who I am. I say, because everybody can say whatever. Who is Mike Rashid? I say, you tell me. Yeah. Because that's what matters. Yeah. What I say doesn't matter, right? The impression that I leave on you is what matters, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the impression that I leave on her is what matters to her or him, to him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But who I am, um, just a guy who... uh, currently own a few businesses. Um, you know, I used to be a boxer, professional boxer, amateur boxer, all of that. That was a big part of my life. Um, my dad was in music when I was younger. Nice. I'm one of those people that did did it all. Like, I just live ferociously. Mm-hmm. So whatever I'm interested in, I just go hard at and I, and I experience it in its, its purest sense. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, outside of business, you know, I am doing a more structured mentorship program. Um, I did my first one I launched uh, the end of last year, which ended uh, in uh, March. But I, I'm i keeping them, my first crew, on board for my next one for free because that was my crew. Right, right. Uh, my, They've been my, there, yeah. My, the originals. Yeah. So that's cool. So I, I get a lot of um, pleasure out of, you know, just coaching them and helping them mm-hmm. and open their mind to certain things and sharing perspectives and things of that nature. Uh, that's what I am. I'm a servant at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a humble servant. Um, you know, I live for others, for the people I care about and that I love. And that's pretty much it. Right on, yeah. right on. Definitely, you said humble. That word stuck out with a capital H because you you definitely being humble right now. You're like, ah, oh, you know, just a guy on a couple you know, businesses, nothing. I, I, listen, because I, I, I typically say I'm not humble, yeah. right? Because for one to be humble is not the most positive thing. To be humble is to like lower your 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 social or political rank. Mm-hmm. It's to be up under, right? But you know, I recently my mother passed away, you know, and I'm just looking at things. I'm adjusting my perspective to an extent, and um, you know, I spent I reconnected with my family on that side of on that side of the family because you know my family from the south and. You know, I grew up in the North, in New York. Mm-hmm. So it was somewhat of a disconnect, right? But we did spend time here and there. But as I got older, I just, you know, I moved out West and, you know, just started getting busy. And I used that as an excuse for like not really being in contact with people because, oh, I'm doing better than y'all, right? Mm-hmm. Like step it up. But this week, last week, when I was back home with my family, you know, I just seen so much beauty in them. You know what I mean? And it was like, who you think you are? Yeah. With your your house and your cars and whatever. Like, you don't got this. Right. That fam- that felt way better than every- anything else that I have. Right. So it that humbled me, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, and I, I desire more of that, mm-hmm. you know? And I kind of rededicated a huge portion of my energy to them, mm-hmm. you know? Because I already got them. Exactly. And they're happy to know. 
I was expecting a lot of them to be like, oh, oh, now you want to come back around. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. they openly embraced me and it felt it so good. That, for yeah. sure, for sure. That's something you you can't buy. Like, that's that feeling of that home right. kind of, you know, with your people. Like, it's, right. it's you can't buy that. Even with your folks, your, your, your friends, it's a great mm-hmm. feeling. But when you're with your blood, relatives, your family, it's just a different feeling. They're going to accept you no matter what. You know, you get to catch up with cousins yeah. and, and different people. So it's that's a beautiful thing. It's something about sharing, like, DNA with somebody, right? Right. It's something about people that look like you, Mm -hmm. you know, people that. And then I'm out there and, you know, everyone's celebrating my mother, hearing everybody's uh, perspective on my mother. Mm -hmm. It was cool. You know what I'm saying? Right. To see how important she was to everybody. Right. You know, so it was it's a beautiful thing Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing and family is it's important it's very important to me 100 percent, 100 percent. so i want to go you know deeper down that rabbit hole when it comes to family um but i do want to give just a a little bit more Mm -hmm. uh, perspective on your story Mm -hmm. because you've uh, peaks and valleys everyone's had peaks and valleys right life is crazy it's not always up it's not always down Uh, but you have a really uh interesting and intense story when it comes to you know having a certain level of success uh, losing it, making it right back, like living right. in different different uh, uh, lifetimes, it seems like. Yeah. And so what can you share about as far as the ups and downs of, of, of your, your past? Yeah, man, I live, I've lived a thousand lives, you know, literally. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up, started out in New York, Brooklyn, New York, right? In the worst time of New York City's history. It's nuts. It's called the, the New York City crime wave. I grew up in the middle of that, right? And Brooklyn, of all places, <laughs> Brooklyn is not even a city, it's a borough. And we had the highest murder rate in the country at one point. <laughs> we was battling with DC, us, DC, us, DC, right? So I grew up in that, you know, and my, it was a very unique situation though because my mother was married to a very uh, successful um, street entrepreneur, if you will. Mm-hmm. And he was a boss, you know, he was a boss in the streets, big boss. So I grew up in that. We was rich. I was a rich kid, right? But then he got killed, and then we weren't we weren't rich anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, the dichotomy was so extreme and so fast, right? So I got to experience opulence as a child. Mm-hmm. I had a driver. You know, I played instruments. You know, it was crazy. Then all of that went away. Mm-hmm. We had no electricity. A lot. You know, my mother had to boil water. So to give me a bath, like stuff like that, Crazy. candles for light, like right, I, right. I've experienced all of that, right? So <clears throat> out the gate, I'm I'm weird. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not a normal um, upbringing. Mm-hmm. And another thing about it is, a lot of kids can ex- kind of coast through things and not really be aware of much. But I was aware of everything. Mm-hmm. I remember so many details from when I was a child. I was always a very conscious kid. And um, and my mother said, you know, we, we, we was going through some old documentary footage that we never used. And she was talking about how serious I was as a kid, you know, like, sounds right. <laughs> right. And, um, but I was always aware. And I used to think about things like one time um, we had these Jamaicans in our basement selling crack mm. for us, for my mother, <laughs> you know. And they would send me to the store to buy, like, blunts, right? Because kids could buy cigarettes in New York. Right, it's different. It's, yeah, different. it's different. There's no yeah. ro- lo- rules like everywhere else. Right. So this particular day, I come back home, and the police is about to raid the house, mm-hmm. right? Now, I'm a kid, and I'm not street smart. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to just walk into the gate. Like, excuse me. You're right, yeah, this is my house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, excuse me. And um, all I was thinking as a kid is, like, they're going to take me to a foster home. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And it's like... When I think back, like, how did I even know about foster homes? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, so I understood so much back then. So luckily, they didn't. They didn't even go in the house. They was at the up up at the porch, up at the front, and down at the basement, guns drawn, all of that. And they had to leave, which I gather they probably didn't have the proper warrant, right, because that's important. So I just remember this vividly. One of the cops saying, we'll be back 1055. We'll be back. That was the address, 1055. He left. My mother went to Florida after that, and I stayed in another part of Brooklyn with my grandparents. So, you know, that that was um, a real interesting part of my life, too, because from there, I went from living in this drug 
uh, uh, like our house corrupted the whole neighborhood. You yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying? Because yeah. we were selling, not me, but they were selling drugs right. out of my house, out the basement. Um, I went from that to move into a, a, a section of Brooklyn called Canarsie, right? And it's very, very nice, middle class, upper middle, mm-hmm. but you still hear gunshots every night. Yeah. And that was just a constant throughout the city. You you couldn't escape that, Yeah, you right? can't get away from that. So, but I was surrounded by just nothing but love. Like, my grandparents were awesome. You know, they were immigrants. And, and one thing about immigrants, like, in New York, is they when they come here, they be serious about, like, being buttoned up, right. getting educated, you know, warm cooked meals, like, all of that. So, so I went from controlled chaos to pure love and structure, mm-hmm. you know? So I had that and it was it was probably the best part of my childhood. And then um my mother came up. So before my mother this also happened when my mother husband died, she started using her own product. Mm-hmm. Okay, and got addicted to crack. Crack was running through the the, the hoods. Right. And you gotta think about this. Crack is looked at as like disgusting, pathetic, right? Cocaine is like, oh, it's rich people shit, right? Right. right. Crack is cocaine. Right. Crack is not even pure as the cocaine. It's watered down, stretched out because people in these communities can't afford cocaine. Mm-hmm. So it's like one one asks, like, how did the crack get there then? Right? Right, right. It was delivered there, right? It funded a war in um South America. Mm-hmm. Uh um it was a proxy war for the United States and Bolivia, right? And they funded it with drug money. They got this stuff to the to the inner cities in these big cities, mm-hmm. blacks and Latinos. Um, they were like, oh, they can't afford coke, so this is how you do the crack. Right. Chemistry, stretch it out, make it, you know. So people were getting um, the jail sentences was over the top. You get caught with like a $5 or $10 rock, of crack, that's like 25 years of life. Right. $10 rock. Crazy, man. You can't sell that. You're smoking mm-hmm. that. Why would you put a drug user in prison? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Whereas when somebody get caught with an eight ball of pure powder cocaine, slap on the wrist. Right. So you can you can draw your conclusions to, to that. Yeah. So anyway, but the way that they would use the crack it gets right into your bloodstream, and I guess the high is incredible. So, so people got addicted very easy. You know what I'm saying? And most drugs, people got to understand this: drugs are not inherently addictive. Like the drug just addicts you. It's circumstances around it. One is price. Crack is cheap. Just like meth is cheap, right? So that's one. And then you're giving it to people in poor. Uh, uh, areas, mm-hmm. very limited resources, no you, people with no social status, things of that nature. So nine times out of ten, if they experience a drug, that's probably the best thing in their life. Right. So it's actually logical for them to be addicted to it. Like it's just I'm escaping this hell that I live in. Right. right so yeah. I'm gonna just keep doing this and feel good. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So um, it's usually circumstances that have people addicted. Mm-hmm. Right. So. So that's what happened with that. But my mother got addicted to crack. Right. Um, so she went to Florida uh, after the house was about to get raided, and she got herself clean, mm-hmm. which is very hard to do. To do. Yeah. Crack cocaine, yeah. people don't it come is, off that that easy. Yeah, yeah. You know, my mother went cold turkey. She's strong. She's a warrior. Mm-hmm. She got off. She went to college. Got her college. Got her first degree. Then got her second degree. Excuse me. And opened up business. Um, she was a nurse, but she did home health care, her own thing. Nice. And I love that, right? Because I, I get that. I got her spirit. I never wanted to work for people. Right. I would work for people that I respected. Sure. But the chances of that is slim, you know, coming up. Yeah. So um, she, she did that. And then she came up to New York and got me mm-hmm. from my grandparents. And that was kind of rough because it wasn't expected by them, you know? And... um. So I went down to Florida with her for about a year, and I hated it. Yeah. It was bad. It was like a culture shock. 
It's like we're all black, but we're not. Right, right. And they treated me like I was white. So, so, but, but why, why, like? Because down south is just very. So we're in the hood, but we're also in the deep south, the country. Got it. So it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, half of my family on my father's side is West Indian, Caribbean, right? They all, we all look the same, but I can't understand anything they say. Right. And they speak English. It's, it's, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It, it was the same for me down in Florida when I first went. Right. It's like, what? Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they would think I'm white if I said, excuse me. Right, like, right. What? That's normal. It's weird, yeah. They would be like, you talk proper. I'm like, right. no, I don't. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, it's just ignorance, my ignorance and their ignorance. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it was a culture shock for me. And then... Things are different now, but back then things were so different. Like, mm -hmm. put it like this: <laughs> I remember my first time going to Florida. I was a kid. I remember this. We're driving on this road. I'm blown away that there's no lights. Yeah, it's like, how dangerous is this? Right, like, right. I'm terrified. It's sketchy. There's nothing in New York that's not lit up. Right. But down south, there's just a lot of dirt roads. Right. I'm shook. Right. It felt like I was back in like slavery days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? yeah. So, and I'm gonna I'm touch on that too. The slavery energy out there, yeah, still there. That's crazy, man. Still there. So anyway, um, just a big culture shock. So I didn't like it. Um, end up getting back to New York, you know, and then just life kept proceeding. Um, when I got a little bit older, I moved out to the West Coast. My father was on the West Coast. Um, my father's a stand-up guy. He, you know. He was a young man trying to figure out life as well and got incarcerated, you know, a couple times. Um, he ended up out on the West Coast. I've never not been in touch with him mm -hmm. all my life, even when he was in prison. When my sister and I would go visit him, they just told us he was in the hospital. Right. We didn't know. Just, yeah, she yeah. knew he was in prison. I didn't. I right. thought it was the hospital. Right. You know? right. So, uh, so I always had my father in, his, in my life. But when I moved out there for like for school, it was more intense. Mm -hmm. My father gave me a lot of life lessons. He gave me a lot of rules on being a man and manhood. So did my grandfather too. So I always have really powerful men in my world, in my, uh, you know, planting seeds in me. So, so I, I come out to Arizona. I'm going to college, junior college first in a university. Um, I dropped out because it was like, I didn't have... I wasn't that disciplined to finish school mm -hmm. because it was no guidance. And um, my parents, my mother helped me with all the paperwork. But after that, it was just like, what am I taking? Own. What am I doing? Right. So I was taking a bunch of classes that didn't add up to nothing. Right, right, But right. things that I was interested in. As most people are. <laughs> I, and I love school. I love college. Right. I love the idea of um, just information and observing, uh, uh, absorbing it and memorizing it and stuff like that. But I did drop out. And um, at this point, I'm off again, on again, off again with my boxing. Every time you stop, it was harder to come back. You mm -hmm. gain weight, you just, you know, you gotta stay on top of that, right? So that was getting harder and harder. And um, I, I love music, rap music, so I was doing that as well. But then I started making some money, street money, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I kind of quit boxing altogether and focused on the hustle. And um, it, I was, it was easy. It was like, this is it. Yeah. Cause it was people that I was helping out that wasn't that smart. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they making this kind of money? Yeah. I got this, you know what I mean? So I was running, running it up, running it up and um, doing really well and kind of like under the radar with it. So I did, you know, for years I was just selling drugs, you know? Stuff that's legal now, right, you know right. what I'm saying? Marijuana specifically, moving it from the West Coast to the East Coast wholesale. It's a straight business, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I'm doing that, doing that, and I'm a I'm an extremely authentic person wherever I'm at, whatever mm -hmm. I'm doing. So started developing a crew, um, and you know I had some real bad dudes in my crew, right? Like soup tasters, we call them. You know yeah. what I mean? And my logic was like, why are they not trying to like rob me or kill me or do whatever, whatever? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I don't know. But I need to show them that I'm as crazy as them. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that, you know, hopping out in the front line when I didn't didn't need to. I'm yeah, the general on the front line. So but I couldn't help it. I just 
I, I'm a I'm an alpha, mm -hmm. you know, in every sense of the word. And then you have a lot of people saying, shouldn't call yourself an alpha. It's not. I'm an alpha. Right it is there. what it is. So um, I'm just like kind of got like that fearless kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. And even if I am scared, no one will ever know because I'm gonna proceed like I'm not. Right. You know what I mean? So now that energy is powerful and there's good in it, but I wasn't doing good things at that time. My conscience started getting to me, you know? I'm like, I gotta stop this shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm paranoid. Um, people I know is getting real serious time. Um, there was a big case, a huge case. You heard of BMF? Mm -hmm. Right, so I almost got wrapped into that because, you know, there was some intermingling and you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. Yeah. And um, I'm just shook. And I'm really trying to like figure out how I'm gonna transition out of it. Um, so around that time, uh, there's a book called Disease, right? I forget the author, I read it a long time ago. And it talks about dis and ease, like the absence of ease, right? And it was saying it's not necessarily biological, but the disease can be a situation that you can attract to yourself, right? Because of your actions, but it's kind of good because sometimes it prevents you from something worse. You know what I mean? And I attracted a disease situation to myself when I look back on it. Um, I come home one day, we're out partying, me and my boys, and... Um, there's a guy in my garage, mm -hmm. right? Like a, a bad looking dude. Right, right. And I live in a nice area. Right. You know what I mean? And you said you're one of the only 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 black people on the block too. So that was another the only, another the only. exactly another he was, giveaway. He was black. But he was like a prison dude, like a, a you know, a career criminal looking rough tattoo yeah. on the face, like, you know. And I like what these rappers do. It's different. Right. These right. guys are different. It's so, a different look. For yeah, sure. yeah. Big, yeah. strong, right. capable looking like uh, a fella. Mm -hmm. So I hop out the car and I'm like, yo, what's up? Mm -hmm. He's like, what's up? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, can I help you? He's like, can I help you? I said, what you doing? I said, he said, this is my father's house. I'm like, okay, okay. And I had my gun behind my back because mm -hmm. it's a right to carry state. Right. I was on it. I had no priors. I was, everything was legit. So he's like, what you got? I was like, oh, this? Mm -hmm. And then he just books it into the crib. So, you know. So it was into the house. Yeah. So yeah. I did what I felt like I needed to do to protect my house. And um, when the police arrived, they didn't think so. You know because your, your family is in the house. Yes. Right. So they was like, yo, you got to match force with force. <laughs> he didn't have a gun. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so make a long story short, um, got arrested, bonded out, start fighting it, then they dropped it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm good, right. they know what's up. Cool. So there's a difference though. There is a way of dismissing a case to where they could bring it back, and there's one where they won't. It's called prejudice or without prejudice. So mine was dropped without prejudice. That means they can bring it back, right? So I'm like, they're not bringing it back, I'm good. And they probably wouldn't have, but I got in trouble again. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is I didn't know this at the time, but they knew everything I was doing. You know what I mean? Here's how it works. And anybody out there doing illegal things, just know this. Mm -hmm. They know what you're doing. Right. There's so many snitches out there. It's unreal. You don't even tough, realize. They're yeah. tough guys. You know, yeah. when a guy is facing 30 years, they're going to, you know, even less. Mm -hmm. So they know everything. These people sit around and study criminals. You know what I'm saying? They can mm -hmm. smell you a mile away. It's just that maybe you're not big enough. Maybe, you know, they want to build a bigger case, whatever. But they keep tabs on people that's really doing things. Everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my case. So they never can catch me doing what I was doing to make money. So but now they have two violent offenses. This is great. On paper, it looked horrible. Yeah. However, each situation was legitimately self-defense, but it just looked bad because I'm a drug dealer. Right. They put everything no together. Job. I ain't got no job. I'm living out here in this big old house, all right. these cars, and I'm young. Yeah. They didn't like that. And it's in like S Scottsdale, Arizona. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Of all places. They right? said, hell no, get rid of this dude. Yeah. So they came at me hard. And, um, you know, I'm fighting and fighting and fighting it, running out of money. 
can't hustle as hard because I'm out on release with an ankle bracelet on. So I don't want to do something and get caught again because right. it'll make it all the way worse. And what I was trying to do is prevent myself from being remanded to custody. That means when you're fighting a case, you bond out so you can fight it for real. You're free. Mm-hmm. If you go to prison, at least you have time to get your affairs in order. Mm-hmm. But, it, but you might beat it. When you're incarcerated and you're fighting a case, it's kind of hard. You can't really freely talk to your people, your lawyers, whatever, strategize because they're listening to you at all times. So I'm preventing that from happening. So something else happens. A disease situation is attracted to me. I get arrested again. This time it looks bad. I have an ankle bracelet on. Um, It was something small and petty. So you have the constitutional right to see a judge within 24 hours to get Mm -hmm. a bond. So it was a cheap, like $1,200. I said, I'm going to pay it. He said, okay, you can pay it, but I don't know if you're going to get out Mm because of your condition, but you might because it was like a weekend. I said, take the money. I'm going to try. I'm not going to not try. Yeah, I'm going for it. So this particular time, I'm getting processed longer than I've ever been processed. Changed my clothes. I never had my clothes changed. Right. Until. That's that part's a trip. So I'm I had that with me too. Yeah. So next step from where I was at, the next place was like to be housed. Like this is where you're gonna be at mm-hmm. for for the duration of the adjudication of your case, and that could take a year. It could take two years. Right. And jail. People don't notice jail <laughs> is worse than prison. Right. They make the conditions really like rough so that you just take a plea. They right. want you to get out of here, plea out. So in prison is a little bit more laid back. Mm-hmm. So except for like where I would have went. So violent offenses is not treated like drug offenses and money offenses and stuff like that. Violent offenses is the worst. So you're in there with the wor- the most hardened criminals, right. max security yards. So they call it gladiator school. So that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right? wild. Yeah. yeah. And listen, incarceration is no place for human beings. Mm-hmm. You have no rights, Mm -hmm. and you're treated worse than animals. Mm -hmm. The food is... One of our dishes, like, or our only dish was called shit on a shank. Imagine what shit on a shank is. Right. That's what... It it was like a hard little bread-like rock thing. Yeah, yeah. With some kind of mush on it. Yeah, you know what's crazy? I think since you said that, I, I remember my dad... I was maybe like six or seven. He brought up a dish, a dish, mm. uh, some kind of meal. Like it sounded something like that. Because yeah. uh, my dad, uh, many backstory is my dad got incarcerated. He got arrested when I was 10 months old, mm. just came back in 2020. Mm. And so he was gone uh, almost 24 years. Mm. And so he was telling me some of these stories. And as you're telling him, like telling the stories of right. kind of explaining of, of what this, what this looks like, right. this is stuff that I would hear about all the time. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and so it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So you're, you're absolutely right. It's definitely yeah. not a place you want to be for not, sure, not for all. sure, for sure. So, you know, time's ticking. I'm about to get, you know, I'm going to be stuck. And then, I'm, what's going through my mind is like, look, I got to fight this case. I can't make money for my fam. What if I get convicted? I don't get to see my kids. And they were trying to give me 15 right. years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm starting to lose it. I'm starting to lose it. Like, my brain went to a dark place. My brain went into this mode. Okay, when they house you, every person that you encounter, knock them out. There's no logic to that. I was just about to ask you, like, what, what was the minds nothing. for that? Yeah. Frustration yeah. and fear. Luckily, they just they came and rolled me out. I was like, <laughs> so I get out. Um, my The officer, who was like a pretrial, whatever, like a probation, but probation is typically after your sentence. Mm-hmm. But this was a pre thing, like, you know, while you're on release. She said, You come in and see me. I said, Why? Usually, I'm, I'm expecting her to arrest yeah, you. Yeah, I'm not going back over like, there. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> she said, I'm not going to arrest you. I'm just going to give you another ankle break, ankle monitor. I'm like, like I, I don't she know. Said, she said, trust me. And I sat there for a minute. I said, all right, I'm going to trust her. So I went, and she didn't arrest me. She told me. But she said, they might arrest you Thursday because I had court that week. So now, I'm not your, or I wasn't your average outlaw. You know what I'm saying? I'm a thinker. I was like ballot Victorian all throughout school, right? I'm, it's not hard to do a lot of things. So mm-hmm. I had a contingency plan on if I went to trial, because I wasn't going to accept 15 years. Like, 
y'all gotta work for that. Right. I'm not gonna <laughs> just take 15 years. Right. So I was gonna try to take it to trial. And as we got closer to the end, if it didn't work out, if I seen it was going bad, I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. I had everything set up already. So when that happened, knowing that I could get arrested early, I just expedited that process and left. I went on the run. So lost everything I had, obviously. And um, the little bit of money I, I did have, you know, I was surviving off of. Um, but once again, I did all my research and I seen what I could do, what I couldn't do. Do they track you with these kind of charges, et cetera, et cetera. And I was right under like the worst things to where everything is tracked, right. right? So according to my research, when you abscound or go on a run, they look for you for about a month, just going to like all your known associates, friends, families, staking out, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then after that, they wait until somebody tipped them off or you just get arrested again because right. most uh, fugitives get rearrested fast, Yeah, you know? So, so I seen what I could do. I could travel, I could do this, I could get a job. My name's not gonna flag. I'm going to do it in my own name. You know what I mean? And I did. I was hiding in plain sight, you know. Um, I had some friends in Cali that was like, yeah, because first I left the country. But then I was like, I left the country to not be taken away from my children, but I'm on the other side of the world away from my children. Right. So I'm so coming, was, coming back. Yeah. So I was coming back to Cali, and I had friends out here that was like, yo, you can stay with us. But nobody expected me to be moving around like I was. Mm-hmm. They, Figured I'd get caught. They were just saying that as a nice gesture. Right, right. So when I get back, I'm like, yeah. They were like, oh, nah, it ain't cool. <laughs> they were shook. Yeah. And I wasn't even mad, right? So I was, your boy was legitimately homeless for a mm-hmm. hot second, you know? So now I didn't sleep on the street. I slept in the gym. I got a job as a personal trainer at the gym. Excuse me. And what I would do is, like, when it's, and I worked all day. Excuse me. When it's late, about to close, I kind of like hide her up, disappear right, a little right, bit. Right, right, mm, Then it's yeah, home yeah. alone, you know? So, um, so yeah, so I did that, make sure I kept kept myself looking clean, haircuts, all of that stuff. Nobody knew. I, my family, nobody knew I was homeless. It's crazy. Because I never like, if I'm down, I don't want nobody to know I'm down. Right. You know? So, um, so I'm handling it, handling it. Um, I never asked for help from nobody, except for one time. Um, one time, like, I think it was before I got that job and all my money was running out. I had money coming in, but it was like a few days out and I'm completely out of money. And I I, I hadn't eaten in a day. And then another day was coming. I'm like, everything was bad. I think I was trying to stay in a motel or something for that night. And I had nobody to, to turn to. Mm-hmm. So I called my father, and this is my father, but I've never asked him for money. Right. And, bro, it was so, I was kind of humiliated to ask, even though he didn't make me feel that way. Mm-hmm. So I call him, and I'm like, yeah, um, because I got an ego, so I'm always like, I'm good. So I'm trying to do all of that, but I'm like, I gotta ask him, ask him, ask him. Right. I'm on a pay phone, and I'm like, my voice is crackling, like I'm a cry. He's like, son, where you at? How much, what you need, I'm gonna send it. What city you in, Western Union. He sent me $300. Bro, that was the best $300 I ever had in my life. Right. That was that money was so meaningful to me because I really needed it mm-hmm. just to eat mm-hmm. and have a place to sleep for a night or two. So that uh, was, uh, up until that point, what was your relationship with your dad like? Like, was it, it where was you kind of, okay, it so it was a good relationship with your dad. Yeah. Okay. But I, I wasn't in communication with my family because I didn't want to jeopardize anybody. Right, right, Because they right. can't consider that aid and abetting a, a fugitive. Okay. Right? So, but I made sure I, they didn't know where I was at, whatever, mm-hmm. and it was very sparse when I would communicate. So, um, so yeah, that, that he came through. Um, so shortly after, got a job, saved up, got an apartment, stopped working at the gym, start training my clients independently. Um, Reluctantly uploading content because I'm a fugitive. I shouldn't be doing this, but yeah, I'm like sneaking out there every now and then. <laughs> well, what platform was it at that time? Was it Facebook? Okay, and YouTube. Okay, and Instagram. Okay, yeah. okay. So Instagram was okay. It was like twenty. Okay, twenty twelve. Okay, yeah. okay. 
So um, I got on YouTube in 2011, mm -hmm. and then when Facebook came out, I started using that. I'm sorry, uh, Instagram, I started using that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in my f so in my name, I just took my last name off. So it was Mike Rashid, because my name is Michael King, right? It's just that Mike Rashid, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No that's, one that, that's why, okay, okay. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name is Michael Rashid King, right? but Mike Rashid, I put a picture of like Muhammad Ali on there, on yeah. Facebook, <laughs> and I would just post really my clients, mm -hmm. like their progress, and it was helping me get more clients and things like that. So every now and then I'm sneaking my content up there, and people were liking it. They liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. So it just started growing like fast. I couldn't stop it. I'm like, all right, well, fuck it. So you went viral on accident. Yeah, He's like, yeah, at least it's for business. Facts, <laughs> facts. So, so I started riding that wave. And um, at this point in my life, I'm completely, I'm an evolved version of myself, right? I'm channeling all of that energy in a positive and productive manner. Um, developing my leadership skills, just, you know, dealing with these clients and things like that. Um, and had my son with me, even though at the, in the beginning I couldn't even afford to have him. Mm -hmm. But when his mother asked me, did I want him? I said, yep. I didn't care if I didn't have it. I didn't right. tell her I didn't have it. Right. I said, let's go. I'll figure I it out. It. And I figured right. it out. And um, that's why we so tight, me and him. So, but I never let him feel any discomfort, mm -hmm. you know? So just doing all of that, man. And, um, but man, life is getting better and better and better. I'm making legal money now, which I never did in my life. Never made substantial legal money till like 2010, 2011. Right, it's crazy. And um, I remember I bought my first car, like kind of nice car mm -hmm. with legal money. It was a, BM a seven series Beamer. I thought I was- It like, meant that much more. Yeah, yeah, man. So, but I'm still a fugitive, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I did have a dark cloud over me. Um, that period of my life, you know, it, it pretty much robbed me of my joy. I'm not a joyful person because I is I had to. It was muted for so long. Yeah. And um and now I, the way I reconcile it is like fuck joy. Like yeah. my joy is fulfilling my purpose and my duties. I don't chase fun. You know what I mean? I don't chase pleasure. I chase well. My pleasure is working mm -hmm. and being productive, and right. I'm I'm good with that. Right. So, um. So yeah, that was lingering over me. And then, bro, you gotta think, I was a fugitive for seven years. It's a long time. That's a long time. So you start moving more freely. You feel like you know everything's normal. But every day I would think about this could be the day, you know? And then when that day happened, it happened, you know? The U.S. Marshals came um, to serve a federal warrant. Um, I was outside of Metroflex gym with my dog. <laughs> He's like this big. Yeah. I was out resting because I was inside sparring, and um, the marshal was like, "What's your name?" I was like, "You tell me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said nothing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know you are, and he started talking to me, and he was so he's super cool, man. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, we've been following you for a while. You was like a, always a couple days ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. And um, he said, "You're a good man, and you do a lot of good for a lot of people. Just get this behind you and move on with your life." I was like, "Thank you." But in my head, I'm like, they about to roast me. Right, to right. Fry me, right. Yeah. Because when you go on a run, it aggravates everything. So you have what's called aggravated um, or mitigated. Mitigate makes it, it's like, okay, well, he went and got his college degree or his GED. So that's a mitigating factor to give more leniency. Aggravated factor is like, oh, he went on a run. Mm hmm. He upscound, he embarrassed the court. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. So they're gonna get paid. So they yeah. yeah, so my bond back in the day was hundred and fifty thousand. This time it was five hundred thousand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's like we don't want you to get out. Right. So I did get out, I bonded out, and um I, I was stacking money, I was making a lot of legal money at the time, and I hired the best lawyer I can money can buy. And he, he whooped the case. Right. And I beat that shit. You know what I'm saying? crazy, man. So, but listen, I was prepared. In my mind, I, I had a contingency plan on if I didn't beat it. Mm -hmm. This time, I'm not running anymore, right? I'm going to just go and face it. And um, if I would have had to sit still in prison, I'm like, that's cool. Y'all going to turn me into Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. I'm going <laughs> to become as smart as humanly possible. Right, you know what right. I mean? I'm going to study and I'm going to work out. That's all I'm going to do. So, you know, thankfully that didn't happen, you know? So, um, 
so yeah, it was interesting. When that dark cloud went away, I kind of missed it. I'm like, this don't feel right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You you miss it because you feel like it gave you more drive to to to. Nah, what was just it? a familiarity. You know what I mean? I was just so oh, used okay. to it. Just like somebody, people that's in abusive relationships, mm -hmm. they don't they're not gonna leave. They're used to that person. Mm -hmm. It's a Stockholm syndrome. It's a real thing. I was used to my dark cloud. I was used to having to worry. I'm used to scanning everybody everywhere I'm at. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a cop in any situation, scenario. Right. I know I can profile them easy. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So, and there can I can show somebody and they're like, no way. Right. Yeah. And 100 yeah. percent they'll be a cop. You right. know what I'm saying? I had to learn these things. Yeah. Um, to to that's how I was out for so long. You gotta think, I'm free for seven years. I only got caught because my videos were going viral after viral after viral right. after viral. Right. So, you know, I wasn't, I got pulled over before, didn't get fucked with. They didn't run me because I was cool, chill, mm -hmm. didn't smell like weed in the car. Because out here in Cali, and this is before weed was legal, they trying to smell in your car, they looking in your car to see what kind of person you yeah, are. They're looking for something. I always had on a uniform, you know what I'm saying? Look clean cut, so they never, and I carried myself well, so they didn't bother me. But yeah, so that's the story, and now I'm here. That's crazy, <laughs> yeah. man. That is yeah. crazy. Holy smokes! Like, so first of all, thank you for giving the whole backstory and, and all the details because that, was that, that helps for. Too. Yeah, yeah. It, see, I, I know there's a lot more to the story for sure. There's a couple things I want to touch on within that story, though. Uh, the first thing, I know that you said you had a great relationship with your dad up to that point, but what was it? Uh, what about that relationship with your dad made you want to call him again? Like that moment of trouble when you felt the most vulnerable. What was it about? you know, that relationship that made you say, hey, I'm gonna call my dad, I gotta call him. That's my daddy, it's my father. Mm -hmm. You see me naked, exposed, you know? You see me at my realest and my rawest when I was small and weak, you know? Can't be tough guy with my father, mm -hmm. you know? Cause that's my father. That's the alpha, you feel me? So yeah, that was what my spirit guided me to do. Mm -hmm. You know. Was it was it always this way? Because I know there's a there's usually a certain stage, you know, when you you come to a certain age, maybe preteen years, you start to kind of puff your chest out. You think you can start take on your dad a little bit. Was never, there any kind of conflict? I never or, had that energy. Really, I never had that energy. There was never been a, a time in my life where I wanted to stand up to my father. Mm -hmm. Ever. Really. Never. Yeah. That's bizarre to me. I don't have. I don't listen. Even people I love, you could spit in my face. I'm not going to do anything to you. You know what I mean? I'm going to be hurt that it's unfortunate, but I can't, I can never give that kind of vehement energy to people that I really love. Mm -hmm. People I don't care about, yeah. It's a wrap. Yeah, but people I love, no. Yeah. I can't. Right. I don't have that. Those genes are not in me. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's always been that way, that kind of relationship, that that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I had a guest on yesterday. We we're talking about uh, respect in the household when it when it comes to you know the man of the house. We mm -hmm. talk about I'm the, I'm the man of the house. I'm the head of the household, and we talked about how we believe you're really the foundation of the house. So you're mm -hmm. supposed to set an example. You're supposed right. to be a leader. Uh, and unfortunately, nowadays, you know, men being softer, that's not always yeah. the case. You and, know, you know what? Why, bro? Uh, excuse me for cutting you off, yeah, but, but just can't tell me. My father respected me and he treated me good. So I never had that animosity. Now, as adults, we got in our arguments and things like that, right? Sure. But but he, as a boy, he treated me good. Like mm -hmm. he loved me and I knew it, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I never had those feelings, those ill feelings towards my father. Right. I loved him, right. I still love him. Right, and when yeah. you say he treated you well, was it, you know, you just said that he, he loved you, of course, um, but it was a little more like he gave you the respect that you felt you deserved, like he made you feel like you were appreciated. Like, what was it about your dad that made you feel that way? Yeah, he he, he planted some very good seeds. And also, his shortcomings, he hid from me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I never even heard my father curse until I was an adult. It's crazy. Yeah. I didn't know my father smoked weed. Right, right. And cigarettes. <laughs> All my this father stuff smoked comes out later. cigarettes. Yeah. I had no idea. That's crazy, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I respect that. That's how it should be, you know? It should be. You should not. Just like social media, right? When I was coming up, like I could eat like a whole pizza for like a cheat meal, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't affect me. But I would never put that out and let my audience see that, and they think that they can do that. Yeah, yeah. everything's different. Like genetics yeah. is different. You may not train as hard as me. Whatever. It's not healthy, so I'm not going to show you that. I don't mm -hmm. show people everything in my life. I only show people 
the things that they can learn something from, mm -hmm. right, and gain from. And that's what my father did with me. Yeah, and yeah. so that's the same thing. First of all, because I want to I wanna pivot a little bit because there's, uh, Bezos has a, uh, one of his, his, his famous clips and quotes is, he talks about there's two different uh, opportunities you have to deal with with fatherhood, right? Mm -hmm. First is when you're the son dealing with your father, and the second is when you have a son of your own, now you're the father. And so now I want to ask you about um, Elijah. At, that, at this age, first of all, how old was he when you were going through the whole... Elijah? Yeah. Five, okay. six, something okay. like that. Okay, he's, so he's, he's young where he probably doesn't understand what's really going on. Nah, okay. but he remembers everything. He's, he's like, I was like very aware, right. very mature and yeah. calm and um, serious mm -hmm. and very aware. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to what extent did he understand? Probably not much back then. He knows everything now. Sure. But um, but I kept him protected and ice and and tucked in. You right. Know? Yeah. That makes sense for sure. So, because mm. I was gonna ask you if it, 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 it speaking from my own experience, like it, similar to what you said, it says mm. you said well, I just thought my dad was in the hospital. I didn't know mm. what was going on. Whatever. Right. I remember um, I was a little kid. I went to a funeral, and uh, they would say like, "Oh, my dad's on vacation." I was like the thing that we would say, right? Mm. But I didn't know that. Like they'd say, "Oh, he's on vacation, on vacation." And so when I got to an age where I was like, "He's not on vacation. He's incarcerated," right? Yeah. I went to a funeral. You of course see different people you haven't seen in a long time, mm. and uh, that means they haven't seen me in a long time. So right. then one of like, aunties or whoever this person was mm. says, "Is your dad still on vacation?" I was like, you know, being naive little right. kid, like, "Oh, he's he's still incarcerated." Like I know, baby, about the vacation, right? Yeah. So. Uh, we the, call it college. Exactly, we right? College. Exactly. Yeah. See? And so so I bring that up because I know how that affected me, you know, understanding mm -hmm. as I got older where he was. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's different for Elijah. He was so little, he didn't understand. But was there any kind of rift in your relationship with him? Uh, even maybe as he got older, you started telling him this is kind of what really what happened. What Was there any, any, yeah. any issue there? Not that I know of. And I asked him, you know, periodically, like, assess me. What don't you like? What do you like? Am I being a good dad? You know, and he he we have the type of relationship that way he can he can come at me however he feels right. That's dope. Question me. I respect my children. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of times parents don't respect their children. Mm -hmm. Shut up. Do this. Why? Because I said so. That's bullshit. Do this. Why? Because if you don't do this, this happens. And you know, you explain things. I talk to my children. They can, listen, me allowing them to have that dialogue with me, mm -hmm. it makes them set them up to not ever be pushovers in society. Right. To not just arbitrarily follow every rule that's put upon you, right? To not a ask questions. You have to ask questions. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't feel right, talk about it. Right. You don't have to accept something just because I, I said so. Mm -hmm. But it just so happened when I'm giving information, I'm being thorough with it mm -hmm. and I'm being patient with how I deliver it, how they receive it, make sure they got it. Um, and they can question me. They, right. They're confident. And that's what I want them. My whole life is predicated upon making my children not need me mm -hmm. and be capable out here in this world. Right, right. And so you know? you, in a sense, you treat them like adults. Like yeah. you treat them with the same respect. With you love. treat them with exactly with, love with on love. them. And right. love is not all like I'm not a. How do I, I'm not lovey guy, but I am. Yeah. In a in a real sense of love, like I love you enough to tell you something that's going to hurt your feelings, but it's true and it's mm -hmm. going to keep you out of trouble, mm -hmm. right? And I'm gonna keep I'm gonna figure out the right ways to communicate that to you because I love you. Right. Right. I'm not going to coddle you because I love you. Right. Coddling you is not loving you. So it's, it's lazy. Right. And it's setting you up for failure. And I can't do that. Right. So I never reward bad behavior. Right. Right. So you mentioned a couple of times how tight you and your son are. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to delve a little bit more deeper into that because I'm sure there's a lot of fathers that are watching this right now where they, you know, matter of fact, I know that's true because even during the Squire program, during, during the actual classes, they talk a lot about um, there's a session or a section of the class where the fathers are separate and the sons are separate. They're with different instructors and they're talking mm -hmm. about different things that they'll be able to talk about. While I'm sorry, this is my son. Here. Go ahead. He's go ahead. There we like go. Over and over. You got to get it. What's up, son? 
Oh, just tell them Mike's laptop is in there. You came to pick it up. But I got to get off the phone, son. Cool. Sorry about that. No, don't worry about it. See, this is, uh, I think it's dope, man. It doesn't matter no matter what. Like, this is literally a, a lesson right there. Like, mm -hmm. your your kids are, are, are need you. And here's the thing. It's not like he was home. I knew I sent him to do something for me. Mm -hmm. So he's out driving. So I'm like, you got to make sure, sure make sure he's good. Yeah, make sure he's yeah. good for sure, no matter what. My only worry is like my kids not being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. being uncomfortable, like in some kind of trouble or something. Right. So right. I'm, I'm always, I'm never at ease until everybody's in the house. Exactly. You know Much respect. Much yeah. respect. Um, and so, I forgot where I was going. Um, uh, oh, yeah. So there's a section uh, of the Squire program, the class, where the fathers and sons are separate. They're with their different uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And so they get to talk about different things that maybe they wouldn't talk about when they're together. The dads, they get the chance to talk about, you know, things that maybe they're uh, maybe insecure about, about their relationship mm -hmm. with their son. Or maybe they don't feel like they're an adequate leader. They, uh, they don't get the respect that they feel they deserve in their house. You obviously have a great relationship with your son. Basically, what I'm trying to get to is is the fact that there's a lot of fathers that are insecure in their position. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like, you know, they 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 have the respect that they feel they deserve in their house. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just unsure of how does a, a, the leader move? You know, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do as a father? How can I not only gain respect for my kids, but, you know, have them feel comfortable to talk to me and communicate? And some of the things mm -hmm. that you talked about that you do yeah. with, your, with your kids, right? What else have you done besides what you just named as far as treating them, you know, with respect, loving them? You know, what what else do you guys practice uh, as far as in the household goes that kind of help build that relationship to where it is today? Yeah, well, first and foremost, um, I do my best to provide the best living situation, schooling situation, everything for my children, right? So there's a degree of... Uh, respect and and appreciation from that alone mm -hmm. in my opinion especially when they're seeing their friends this and the third or you know they know that we're 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 fortunate right so i know they appreciate that um just like keeping a a peaceful home right i don't allow no chaos in my house you know no chaos it's, it's chill it's peaceful it's quiet um, it's safe, you know. Um, when you say no chaos, do you mean like if somebody came in, they were bringing some drama? He said, "Man, you got to cut that." Okay, like that's that's what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, when there's disagreements, we talk calm. Um, I think they appreciate that a lot, especially my son. Excuse me. Um, just being me. This is my. This has always been my thing to be super dad, to be the ultimate father, right? Mm -hmm. To my children, so they're, they're proud, like right. that I'm that. Like when, so Elijah and Kaya is about a, a year and some change apart. So when they're like, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth grade, like I'm there for lunch, having lunch with, with Elijah, then Kaya. And I would, when I come, I take all the ladies Chick-fil-A in the front office That's cool, and, and everybody want to sit with them. Right, right. Dad is cool dad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I was there consistently. So whenever yeah. I was in town, so little things like that. Uh, with my daughter, the daddy, daddy daughter uh, dances. Mm -hmm. We're everyone, mm -hmm. you know. So all of these little things, you know, that quality time, that conversate, talk, like, what's up? What you think about this? Mm -hmm. Right. They appreciate that. They feel, res I think they feel respected, right, you know? Right, right. See, what, with me, like, growing up, and I love my parents to death, but I learned from them what to do and what not to do, mm -hmm. right? There's no shut up because I said so. That's what I got. Right, you know what I'm right. Saying? So you, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was like, stay in a child's place and all that. Like, what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? Why are you embarrassed for my your kid to be here and mm -hmm. asking you a question or questioning you? question me mm -hmm. i want i would like to be questioned so i can you know f firm up my position and you understand it and you mm -hmm. all right now you can go away mm -hmm. with satiated with a with a reason why i'm saying xyz you know what i mean so i don't i don't really have any insecurities so the fact that i don't i'm an open book with my children and with anybody else when I do interviews, sometimes people, they like, what's off the table? I said, nothing. Right. Do you want a list of questions? Nope. Yeah, I'm good. I, whatever you want to talk yeah. about, we can run it. I have no, I'm not embarrassed about nothing in my life. Listen, I, I lean into 
things that I looked at as like, oh, you did what? Like, yeah, I did this. Mm-hmm. That's where I was at in that part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've atoned, you know. See, people got to understand, like, when you mess up, you can't just, like, seek forgiveness, but you have to atone. That means doing something to, like, tip the skin tip that scale back to good. You right. know what I'm saying? Don't just like, yeah, I'm sorry, I messed up. Right. I don't like sorries. I don't like apologies. Right. Because people just get, they give them out too freely and it means nothing. Mm-hmm. Do something. I, I do want to ask you a little bit more like clarification on this part because I think it's interesting. I love mm-hmm. the fact that you said that you're, number one, you're not embarrassed of anything that's mm-hmm. happened in your past. You own it. You say, this is where I was at in that particular part of my life. Um, then on the other hand, you've also said that you... Uh, protect your kids from seeing certain things, right? Mm-hmm. Because like if like, for example, you get the example of if I'm gonna have a cheat day and go crazy at pizza, I can do that. They probably can't do it. So I'm not going to show them. So where's the balance between uh, not showing them certain things that you're, that mm-hmm. you do or have done. And then also being vocal and open and communicating like you, you do as well. Right. So I'm real. One thing about me, I'm real. I happen to not do things that I have to hide. Mm-hmm. I just don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, I really don't. And that's just the the the, the, the bottom line with that, mm-hmm. you know? Because I don't want to be like, do as I say, not as I do. I'm not that guy, mm-hmm. you know? Now, I do want them to do things differently than how I did. Like, I wanted to, as soon as I could, be out the house and live on my own. That's stupid, you know? Right. Stay home as long until you're about to get married. Mm-hmm. There's literally no reason for you to live on your own. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> you're going to have to find a job to pay bills. Facts. So you're running on a hamster wheel just to pay bills, mm-hmm. just to sleep and get back on a hamster wheel so they can give you a little paycheck to pay bills, sleep, and keep making somebody else rich. Right. Absolutely not. Save right. your money. Like, my son got a lot of money saved because I'm like, yo, save all your money. Mm-hmm. If you need some. I'll buy it. Just mm-hmm. ask me, you know? So save your money. Um, and I don't want you getting your own crib, mess around, get somebody pregnant mm-hmm. or whatever, get your heart broke because you don't know nothing about relationships. Right, You right. know, young men, we're not men until we're older. Right. Get a little more more seasoned mm-hmm. with experience. You know, you can't, you don't know what to do with these women. Women are powerful right, you know right. it's funny because i see at the gym i go to every now and then i go like in the evening yeah you see the young kids and maybe they're all 18 or 19 and the women the girls are like fully developed women right and the guys are like little boys they don't get I'm it like, you have no idea <laughs> they don't get it she's about to kill your heart yeah <laughs> you know what right. I'm so you know um but yeah i want to protect them from all of that you know it's not necessary to go through i already went through it and i can tell you right you know mm-hmm. so they understand that. Um, but yeah, that's okay. that's pretty much it. Just making sure there's structure in the house. You gotta understand, people respect sh- humans, dogs, all creatures respect and appreciate structure. Exactly. A degree of predictability, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's there's an, a, an appreciation with that. I'm a disciplinary person, but I'm not mean. Right with the kids there's no reason to be right exactly yeah. a structure it's a structure a structure okay mm-hmm. there's there's one part i want to touch on that you said i think there's a perfect segue because you talked about the fact that stay home as long as you need you know develop yourself you know, become maybe a little bit more emotionally mature mm-hmm. this is something i can relate to personally so i'm 27 now mm-hmm. but i remember i mean just a couple of years ago i was living at my mom's place and i used to hate when the yeah, I'd see people from, you know, maybe from high school or whatever, right. like, oh, where are you living now? I would hate saying that I still live with my mom. It was right. just like a, it was like an ego thing, right? Mm-hmm. And it would bug me. And so I was like, man, I need to move out. I need to move out. I need to move out, right? And then you move out and it's awesome, right? And especially now I have a family. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Uh, but I realized that, you know, I, I, there was there was nothing wrong with being in that stage in my life, uh-huh. right? Yeah. But again, you got to become a little bit more emotionally mature to, to realize that. And that's something that you talk about in your content. You talk mm-hmm. about many to become more emotionally mature yeah. and how you said that the the lack of emotional maturity for you at a certain point got you in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. How did you get yourself out of that, you know, where you kind of develop more emotionally mature? Well, let me touch on this first about like why I say stay home. First of all, I tell people all the time, divorce yourself from this culture, Right. This culture is not conducive to a real life of freedom, of liberation, of sovereignty. It's not. This culture is designed to make you, you know, a slave to an extent, you know, 
oh, get this credit. Get this. You know, when I was in college, I had yeah. credit cards and For shit days. like that. Yeah. It was so easy. Right. Get in debt. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, live on your own. Get a car note. Right. For what? Mm -hmm. For what? Right. This is a consumeristic society. Right. The average American family has about three grand saved. The average Japanese family has about 30 grand saved. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They don't buy things on credit. They buy it. Right. They it, right. So this is just a, an interesting um, society we live in. We have a, this is a capitalistic society, right? But it's at what cost? You know what I'm saying? I'm a capitalist, but shit, I'm a conscious capitalist. Right. Because nobody cares. There's no, there's no humanity. There's no concern about people's well-being because it's all about the dollar and i got this thesis about god and most people to most people god is money and violence think about it to most people god is money and violence being meaning that this pretty much anybody for the right amount of money will do some really weird things mm -hmm. right and also violence moves people the 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 potential threat of violence will make people act how they need to act. And the evidence of that is the world that we live in, mm -hmm. the country we live in. This is the leader of the world, United States. Why is that? We got the most money. We got the biggest military. Mm -hmm. We the bad boys. You know what I mean? And we commit atrocities, murder, start wars, do this, do that. But you know, we, we, we explain it in a certain way and right. and we're all okay with it, right. right? We're complicit, right? Why? Because it's, look, and, and even me, when I, you know, I lived out the country for a while. I lived in the Middle East, I lived in the UAE. Beautiful, it was dope. But I seen like me getting a different perspective of things, like in r the real world, I'm like, yo, this shit is crazy. Yeah. We did what? Right. Okay. I felt like the United States was like our parents and our parents was killers and drug dealers. But I'd rather be at my parents' house because I'm safe mm -hmm. and we got all the shit. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Even though we're killers and drug dealers. Right. So people give a pass to people that are wealthy. You know what I mean? They mm -hmm. just do. I mean, look at Epstein. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Billionaire or whatever potentially molested many children and kids and had this weird island, but everybody was hanging out with him. Mm -hmm. And they knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So people give passes to, to people with money because money can change their lives, right? I don't give a fuck. Money don't move me, and I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of dying, so violence don't move me either, right? So, to, but to most people, money, and violence is God. They can say God, Jesus, Allah. They can say that all they want. But let's look at reality. Let me put a million dollars in front of you. You know what I'm saying? Or a gun. Like, look, if you don't do this, I'm going to X, Y, Z you. Mm -hmm. Do it then. Real men like Muhammad Ali, that was a man. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali stood up when they tried to send him to the Vietnam War. He says, no. Not doing it, yeah. He said, I'm not going to go kill all these brown poor people. They never call me nigga. Y'all call me nigga. Mm -hmm. Why well, I'm gonna go fight them? No. I'll face the firing squad. They took him out, out of boxing at the prime of his career. Right? Mm -hmm. They wasn't making millions of dollars back then. They wasn't making the money these guys are making now. Right. But take it away. Take it. I'ma stand I'm gonna stand on what's right and what's true. And look what happens. He's vindicated. He's a legend. You know what I'm saying? We're all gonna die. People like, oh, but look, he's all Parkinson's. So what? Mm -hmm. He went out like a boss, like a legend. That's right. That yeah. that was a glorious death, and I I pray that I have a glorious death. Mm -hmm. I don't want a mundane existence. Mm -hmm. I want to stand for something and and be look. Let me be a source of inspiration and a blueprint on how one should conduct themselves in the world. Mm -hmm. Like Ali, like a real. That was a real man. You know right. what I mean? You don't have that these days. You have, you remember when a few years ago, the the owner of the Clippers, he said some racist some remarks racist, yeah, yeah. and the players, they just turned their jerseys inside out. Right. I'm like, oh my God. Right. <laughs> Don't play. Right. You're still playing mm -hmm. for Massa. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. Look, 
if it doesn't bother you, which that's fine too. Say it don't bother me. Mm -hmm. I'm playing. But if you act like, oh, this is offensive, I'm gonna turn my shirt inside out. Right. That's taking a Knock it off. I'm Knock like, it off. All right. <laughs> Knock it off. Y'all divas. Y'all yeah. soft. You yeah. know what I mean? So is is just that's a real man. Like mm -hmm. that's like take it off from me. Take mm -hmm. all the money. Lock me up. Well, let me touch on that then because yeah. you obviously have that quality and there's there's a, a specific example. Uh in February, it was where it was like fifteen of us at this dinner, right? Mm -hmm. We had Bray Chop House. And at the head of the table, it was a gentleman named Roland. I was next to Roland. Bedros was at the head of the table, and then you were mm -hmm. right next to him. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a, a debate. I'll say a debate, right? right? That happened between you and Roland. Mind you, you just met him that night, yeah. but you were confident enough, mm -hmm. man enough to just say, "Well, if I don't agree with what he's saying, let mm -hmm. me, you know, I'm not just here being aggressive and imposing what I'm saying, but yeah. I want to hear what he has to say right. and question it. Like it's yeah. it's normal, right? It came to a point where everyone else at the rest of the table they stopped talking, they were looking up at the, at the where we're at. Like getting entertained, like this is yeah. crazy, and I'm sitting here in the middle of you guys just looking back and forth, like soaking up the game. Right. So, anyways, my point being the fact that you have that confidence with somebody you just met that day, you're mm -hmm. confident enough to have like damn near like an hour long, yeah. you know, a uh, conversation, debate, whatever you want to call it. Where was that developed? Because there's a lot of guys that are they're too soft that they won't do that. They're scared of confrontation. Yeah. Just I understand life. I mean, I'm understanding life more and more as we go along. And I am a confident person, thanks to my mother. My mother instilled in me a lot of confidence, right? And, you know, confidence comes from being competent, right? Now, competent at what? Competent at being logical and rational and objective. Mm -hmm. I'm competent at, at these things. Right. So I, I don't re recall the exact thing we were talking about, but I remember he was emotionally attached to some things that were not necessarily true. Sure. And I'm like, let's talk about this. Let's. Let, why do you feel like that though? Mm -hmm. Let's challenge it. And here's the thing with me, I'm always right. <laughs> I'm always right. I know that sounds crazy, right? Yeah. But this is what I mean by that. If I'm engaging someone yeah. in some intellectual um, back and forth on something that we disagree upon, mm -hmm. I'm right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you why. Cause I'm not gonna talk about it if I don't know. Right, right, right. <laughs> I'm out. You either know or you I'm don't. I, yeah, yeah. I don't believe <laughs> anything. I either know or I don't know. Right. You know. So, yeah. and I, 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 whatever we were talking about, I knew what it, the deal was. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, cause look, I'm a big nerd, bro. Mm -hmm. I, re, I, I study a lot of shit, mm -hmm. right, and I research a lot of things, and I memorize a lot of things. So there's there's often times when there's subjects that come up that I know about. So I'm like, oh. Let me hop in there. You say, yeah, for sure. I'm down. You don't yeah. really know what you're talking about. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I never, it, if you recall, I didn't say nothing crazy to him right. to yeah. make him feel stupid or look stupid. Um, and, and see, I'm going to show you another thing, patterns in human behavior. When, and he was a cool dude, but he, uh, his tactic was just to keep getting loud. Sure. Yeah. You lost. Yeah. Because yeah, that's, it what, didn't work. that's yeah. the only thing. Don't you want to be really heard? Right. You know what I'm saying? But that's mm -hmm. what people do when the logic ain't logicking. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Right. The yelling starts. For sure. The loud yeah. and the, exactly. a, a passion. Right. My you know my saying? view of that conversation was uh, logic versus emotion. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, I, yeah. like I said, that's I was just sitting there soaking up the game. Like, mm -hmm. this is literally. And what did it make you feel? How did you, as an outside, outside observer, mm -hmm. What did you gravitate towards more? Like, which side? Well, naturally, and this is not just because you're right here, mm -hmm. but I was already uh, same, you know, school thought of you when it mm -hmm. comes to that specific topic. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time in my life when I would have sided with Roland. And by the mm -hmm. way, guys, if you're trying to figure out what we were talking about, the conversation was, was talking about America. I don't want to get on that topic. I know mm -hmm. we're trying to stay on. But just to give you a better understanding of what it was, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, issues with basically Roland was saying that America's racist. Mike was saying, that's not true because this and that. And so I, at some point, I did agree with Roland. Mm -hmm. Like when I was younger, I was frustrated and I was mad and, and, yeah. and, and emotional too. But then I got to a point where I started learning a little bit more, paying a little more attention to, to politics. Mm -hmm. And then I carried myself different. And I realized I don't have that stuff happen to me. Right. So anyways, uh, at this particular, uh, particular stage in my life, I'd already side with, with your you know mm -hmm. uh, frame of thought anyways. And so when I got to see this play out, logic versus emotion, I was just, I was. See, and for me, it's crazy when I see an adult man, emotional. Right, right. Dang, you didn't work on that? Right. You right. don't want to work on that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got to get past that, that lesson. Yeah. So it's like, 
I feel like certain things, like, and I'm like you, like, uh, when I was younger, I was passionate, emotional about a lot of things, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But you, as you get eight, older, you're like, that's kind of weird. I don't want to be like that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to stand on nothing. Let right. me learn this stuff first. Let me understand it. Let me, I remember when I, I remember when Trump got in, and I was like, man, fuck him, he a racist. But I said, ah, why am I saying that? And I went and looked up and researched why I thought that he was racist, mm-hmm. and it wasn't the case, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't even care if he's racist or not. Mm-hmm. This, I don't. Right. It has no impact on my life. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. But that comes with confidence. Right. For sure. And that took time. And yeah. obviously, you developed and worked away, chipped away at that. Right. Another perfect setup. You're throwing these layups, man. These alley-oops. So, hey. so listen, listen, man. We got to talk about this, man, because there's – I told you before we started recording, the the content we post is just going crazy. It's going viral. We had a couple videos – um, that went, you know, super viral, right? Mm-hmm. And I want to get on, uh, touch on both those videos. And I'll start with the, uh, I guess, the the negative response first. Mm-hmm. One okay. of them was very uh, negative response from the from the comments. Other one was super positive, right? So the negative one was we were in Texas in late April, a couple months ago, and Darnell, for context purposes, he's African American, right? He's black. He's the, 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 like the, I guess you could say the owner. He's the licensee of that franchise, of that location. So he's the one who runs that whole location. So obviously he's a big deal there. Mm-hmm. He gives a speech, uh, Houston. Okay. So he, in the beginning of the class, he gives a speech where he says he lists off a couple of different names. And these are all names of white kids, right? Mm-hmm. Who, school shooters, right? Mm-hmm. Then he lists off another four, five, six different names. They're all black kids who were gunned down by police, right? Mm. And he talks about how this is not about race, but I say that to say that the common denominator between these two groups of people are the fact that they all grew up in fatherless homes, mm. right? Of course, the Squark program talking about fathers and sons. Yeah. So that's the, the 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 subject matter of what he was trying to get at. Now, I filmed that because I'm behind the scenes. I'm filming all oh, this is fire content, right? I mm. chop it up. I put it up on online and boom, I'm getting numbers like crazy automatic. I'm watching it blow up, <laughs> all negative. <clears throat> black people were pissed like yeah. they were talking about you know uncle tom this and coon this mm-hmm. and like you guys you know out of pocket for this and you know uh out of touch and this is you know you know uh mm-hmm. racist and all this stuff right so now it's really, i'm like sitting here like i, I was question yeah was there anything that he said that you could see why they would say that the only thing i would say is the fact that these two groups of people were even in the same video. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I could say. Because okay. as far as the way he said the, the message was laid out, mm-hmm. I didn't see anything wrong with it. Right. But I could see where just the fact that they were in the same video, don't associate them, right? Mm-hmm. But he associated them not because they're similar as far as them as people, but because of their living situation and what they grew up in, which you know led to one thing or the other, obviously two right. different paths. And so, mm-hmm. uh, so it was crazy, man. But anyways, when you hear me say that, uh, talk about that 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 video, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think, first of all, that was a brave thing to put up yeah. because that is a nuanced conversation that a lot of people are not capable or ready to have. That is a conversation for the micro and not the macro, right? You got to think about the way that people are used to being fed information. Mm-hmm. It's bullshit, like the news headlines, right? Um, very obvious things. Nothing's obvious. My mother told me nothing is obvious, you know? Right. So that makes one be mindful about jumping to a position. You you want to sit back for a minute and observe it and understand mm-hmm. it a little bit more. Sit on it, sleep on it. You know what I'm saying? Why do you feel like this? Why are you feeling like that? Why does this seem like that? So people are not, unfortunately... I do feel a shift changing in the conscious in the collective consciousness of people being more open to nuanced uh, uh, breakdowns of how our society is here in America with accountability, self accountability being the thing. Mm -hmm. When one employs self accountability, one is less to blame others for their shortcomings, right? Now, 
Does racism exist? Yeah. Is it holding me back? No. Right? Or does it exist? I don't know. Does ghost exist? <laughs> Maybe. But I don't believe in it. Right. It's not affecting me. Right? Now, as time goes on now, let's not get it twisted. <laughs> this country was based, was built on the backs of black people mm -hmm. for free, mm -hmm. right? That's evil, but we call it racist too. Mm -hmm. But that's evil, you know what I'm saying? This particular race of people, not all of them, just the ones who had money, right. were benefiting off of people that look like us, mm -hmm. right? And not paying them anything and treating them really bad, very evil, like some de demonic shit, right? Mm -hmm. Is demonic, is bad. So I understand why people will gravitate towards race to an extent, but it's time to have a more nuanced conversation. Now, sometimes that's hard because um, there are, and I got mad white friends, but they're not ready to hear, mm -hmm. like, let's talk about 1600s on up. Right, right. right. They don't want to, yeah. right? Critical race theory, it's a big thing. Affirmative action, it's a big thing, right? When people, it's interesting because I have friends, I'm not political, I'm apolitical, I don't give a fuck about politics. But I think people would look at me as a more conservative type of person, right? In terms of my ideologies. But I don't fit into any box, mm -hmm. but they think that so when they talk to me, they throw out affirmative action. I'm like, right, right. yeah, run that check. Right. Yes. Right. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's owed to us. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And they're like taking it back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like. And then I, I bring up the obvious, like, right. we gave reparations to Germany, to Japan, mm -hmm. to Iraq, everywhere we fucked up, right? Even Israel, we didn't do nothing to them, right? What about us? We're Americans. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got my, I did my family genealogy, and my family has fought in every war. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? First World War. Mm -hmm. Like, run it. Run that bag, baby. And don't worry about how I spend it. Right, right. That's my problem. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, but what if they just go? I had a guy say, what if they just go and blow it? So what? Right. Do you, do you, when you pay your employees, you lecture them on how to spend it? Right. You, you got to control it for them? Like, right, nah. Right. Pay us, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So there, there are some things that, um, there's racism here, mm -hmm. but it doesn't hold anybody back mm -hmm. anymore. Right. It used to, right. like 100%. And if you know certain areas is like like this, like get out of it, mm -hmm. get out of it. I'll tell you one thing right now, where I live at, I get all kind of privilege right? because of where I live at, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? What I the cars I drive and how I carry myself ultimately, because we're dealing with humans, you know. And if you're nice to somebody, now here's the thing. My assessment on let's say like police brutality, things of that nature, it happens to everybody. No, it happens to poor people. It happens to people that are that don't appear to be protected, you know. Right. So that's the issue. It's socioeconomic more than race. Race is not good for the bag. To be racist, that's not good for the bag. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially the fact that <clears throat> in a lot of sectors in society, you need black people for their excellence and their brilliance to make money. You can't be racist. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Some people might try to take advantage, but that's on. If somebody take advantage of me, that's on me. Mm -hmm. I allowed it. Right. You know, this is not the 60s. Mm -hmm. Let's get it twisted. We live in an information era. Right. You know what I'm saying? I know people that's become multimillionaires in the past three years just online, figuring shit out, being creative. Right. So I don't I don't do the excuses. I don't want no excuses. I'm not giving no excuses. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's no. Yeah, I'm, I'm race. It's a thing. I don't like it. Mm hmm. I wish we were post-race, which we're not. However, it's interesting because we're going into, I think they said in a generation or two that America will have a race. It's gonna look like my kids. Yeah. Like, you can't tell what they are. Right, right. You know what I mean? Um, so that's gonna be interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what's all this now, right? Same with mine, I get you, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but you know, you gotta think like, 
I think that people should have a white people and black people have a a, a detailed breakdown of history for real. Mm -hmm. Black people because black people need to have knowledge of self. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna break something down, and I'm sure you know these things. Before um, uh, colonization, before like uh, Spain and UK and um, all these European places start going out colonizing the world, France and Belgium, right? Um, Africa, in particular Mali, parts of Ghana, Kemet, which they call Egypt, uh, Timbuktu, I think is in Mali, Ethiopia, was like the hub of knowledge. Scholars from all over the world would travel there, from Asia, from Europe, from the Middle East, you name it. They had a system called the Kemetic Mystery System, right? It was a 16-year education process, right? Crazy. In which not many people has ever completed the full 16 years that was not from those regions, mm -hmm. right? Socrates wrote about these Egyptians are so stingy with their knowledge, right? Like, no, bro. I can't go to Harvard and want my degree in six months, mm -hmm. ride it out. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. So all of these things that are hailed in society, Pythagoras theorem, that was utilized thousands of years before Pythagoras was born, right? Uh, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, actually Emotep was his teacher. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Emotep was the first multidisciplinary genius ever documented, you know what I mean? With medicine, mathematics, and architecture, you know? These are, this is the well of wisdom that many of the great scholars drink from. So we should know that mm -hmm. because it'll give, it will give black men more respect and dignity for themselves mm -hmm. to conduct themselves as these scholars, as these geniuses, as these great powerful people, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because it's in your bloodline. And it will have, say for instance, the, the, the white fellas that may have, hold on to some racial biases due to how they were taught that these people are monkeys, they're not humans. They were miseducated, but they should know as well, like, no, those are those are gods, right. you know what I'm saying? So, and and I don't like to do the black white thing. White people are great as well, mm -hmm. you know. The contributions to society is great right. that they've done, you know. But so is so is ours, right. right? And so everybody needs to have knowledge itself because everybody would treat each other with more respect. Right. So peep this out. When you go back to when they were rounding up blacks for slavery, right? When they was march being marched from the shanty lands to the coast of Ghana, say out of every group of 10 people, it was a long, hard, rugged march or ruck. Out of every 10, seven would die, right? So you got three. They put in slave castles, put on the ships, sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Out of every three, two would die, right? So every time you see a black person here in America, that their lineage is through West Africa, through the, uh, the slave channels, you gotta respect that person. That person is fucking solid. His lineage and bloodline made it. Mm -hmm. Most died, you feel me? Like right, most right. could not survive. Right. You go crazy, you kill yourself, or they died along the way. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that should give black people that degree of respect for themselves and for each other. Mm -hmm. Because look, we were taught, we were, they did a, they had a brilliant strategy with controlling us. It was evil, but it's brilliant. It was all divide and conquer, you know? And they had us hating each other, you know? That's why even to this day, black people, you see a black dude, it's another black dude's car, I remember, this is funny, this is years ago, I'm in Arizona and my barber, and I, this is a long time ago, I had the, you remember the Dodge Magnums? Yeah. Those yeah. station wagon looking right. ugly. So I had one, I was young, and I had like a Hemi sticker on it, but it wasn't a Hemi, right? right? <laughs> and I told my barber, like, yeah, it's not a Hemi, though, yeah, yeah. but it looks fresh, right? Yeah. And I remember I'm sitting in there, he's so, 
wanted to hate on me so bad. Yeah. Somebody was like, oh, that Magnum tight. Right. The first thing he said, it ain't a Hemi, though. Right, right, right. They just, they he can't, didn't ask they can't about help that. it. Yeah, exactly. You can't black people hate on each other. But that's how we were taught. Mm -hmm. That's how we, you know, you know, you have, you had your people in the field, you had your people in the house, and slaves, right? They hated each other. Mm -hmm. They hated each other. And then the people in the field hated each other mm -hmm. because you, I'm fucked up, you fucked up. Like, I don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they would put people together. Like, Africa is not a monolithic place. Like, people might be the same skin color, but most of them couldn't communicate with each other. Right, different right. languages, different tribes. They knew that. And they would mix and match. There was no way for you to properly communicate with each other for a long time. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So they did a, it was a brilliant strategy of divide and conquer. And you remember the term cracker, mm -hmm. right? They use, use that for white people. Right. You know why? I'm not exactly sure now. Crack the whip, yeah. right? So that's like the manager on the plantation cracked the whip. Mm -hmm. White people didn't crack the whip. They made black people crack the whip, yeah. one of the blacks. Right? Think about the psychology, psychological fuckery that is. Mm -hmm. I hate them niggas. I hate them. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Think about a black cop that go extra hard on a black kid. That's right. Oh, this man. It, it happens. Yeah, I'm trying sure to the show time. them. Think about Barack Obama, bro. Mm -hmm. He's a cracker. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama, listen, he did nothing for black people. Yeah. Nothing. Everyone has a degree of nepotism, and that's fine. That's natural. natural. Not him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When he went to Flint, Michigan, when they was having the water crisis, now this affected everybody, white and black, poor people, right? Protect them. But you hear the black poors a lot because we're a vocal people. Right, right. He went and he made excuses for the lead in the water. Like, oh, it's not that bad. He act like he drank the cup. Yeah, Did you see yeah, that? yeah, yeah. It's crazy, Bro, man. I was appalled. Wild. I was appalled. Wild, yeah. So that's a cracker. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So... We need to like respect ourselves and respect each other, but you can't respect each other. I can't respect you if I don't respect myself. Right. You know, that has to happen first. There's no, no one talks about accountability. Mm -hmm. No one talks about like, I, I break down life with my children like this, like son, listen. Life and time waits for no one. You know what I'm saying? Your excuses. It doesn't matter. Right. Because somebody else is going to go do it. Right. And you're going to be sitting there like, you know, so when you can hold yourself accountable and know that life will only be good if you make it good for yourself, you will have a different perspective on things. You know, I'm not blaming nobody for nothing because I'm in control of my destiny. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is. Mm -hmm. I am my own self, Lord and master, you know. So my connection to the most high is telling me work. Mm hmm be a good person, you know, correct your wrongs, read, study, work out, do these things, do things that make you powerful, strong. Nobody makes anybody powerful. Nobody could do anything for anybody. You know what I'm saying? So these are things that unfortunately are not taught in our society. Right. right? I'm a huge fan of like Bushido. I love warrior code throughout the world in different cultures. And Bushido was so it was built on so much honor, mm -hmm. right? And it was all for self, like meditate, get inside your own mind, understand yourself, mm -hmm. self mastery, right? We don't have courses on that, right? I do, right? right. I teach it, right? Because it's important. Master yourself. You can't master anything if you can't master yourself. Mm -hmm. I have people that in my family and people that follow me and homies of mine. We all fast every Wednesday. If you, that's a gateway to self mastery. If you can control the food that you put in your body, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Discipline. Yeah, yeah, for you sure. Know? So, automatically, mate, for you, it's it's always leaning into accountability. That's that's the, I think, the foundation I'm catching on throughout this conversation. It's accountability. I got myself in a situation. I'm gonna figure out how to get myself out. Correct. Uh, and so. Much respect, and I think that's something that all people need to adopt for sure. The last thing I want to ask you, and honestly, Mike, I'm going to be honest. I don't even know if there's an answer to this, but I'm going to bring it up all because, right. you know, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple months ago, uh, Bezos tagged me. He made, he made a post about the Squire program on his page, uh, and somebody commented on there because in the picture he was teaching, you know, whatever he's talking about, right? It's a picture, so I don't know what he's talking about, but he's sitting on these, um, uh, like, these boxes, and he's teaching and all the kids, you know, white kids, Hispanic kids, you know, whatever kids, right? There's no black kids in the picture. Mm -hmm. Just so happened to be that way. Uh, 
but if I'm honest, there's not that many black people that come to the Squire program. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's because of the 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 uh, percentage of um, how many black kids don't have their dad to participate, or mm -hmm. maybe they see they don't see enough black people there, mm -hmm. so they don't want to go. But one of the the guys commented, he said, "Where are all the black kids at?" Mm -hmm. Right? And then Bezos mm -hmm. was like, "You know, I forgot what he responded with." Um, but uh, the guy they had a quick back and forth. The guy was kind of coming with an attitude, more emotional, complaining, things like that. So he tagged uh, me. Mm -hmm. He tagged you. Mm -hmm. He I tagged. Okay, no worries. I don't. I he, don't do social like that's that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, you probably have somebody handle it for you. But he tagged some people that um, are doing positive things in our community, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, anyways, the whole point being, I'm trying to figure out how to how to have more black people feel like, yeah, this is our program too. Like yeah. it's not just a yeah. white program, a Spanish program, Asian program. Yeah, you know but the, how do you, how do you, yeah, you know, I communicate, got, you know? That's a good question. Like, it's interesting. Um, so we need to be, we need to participate. Like I need to participate. You know what I'm saying? So that, cause look, it is what it is. I got mostly black people to follow me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? White guys got white people to follow. Mexicans, Mexican. That's mm -hmm. normal. And that's fine. That's what people are comfortable with, right? And they're familiar with, right? So, you know, they just need to see it. Now, I'm going to bring something up. I was reading this article, and it was breaking down, like, there's a myth that black men don't take care of their children. Mm -hmm. They broke down the breakdown of fathers like by race whatever <laughs> right, right, right. who's usually home with their kids and his black men is the highest you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. it's interesting but that's not the marketing material sure. that's not proper yeah. marketing yeah you know what i mean you gotta you can't teach exactly that. you can't show that <laughs> right so but there's I, I guess there's a couple things here's one um and i'm just be honest black men we're very macho you know what i'm saying and i can see if somebody may follow bedros or whatever like I don't need him telling me how to do my, my son. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yeah. But it's just the person delivering the message. That's mm -hmm. it. And my thing is this. I'm about the message being received mm -hmm. well, not the mechanism of, the, not the messenger. You know what I'm saying? So you need black men communicating to black men to bring them to the Squire program. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact, bro. Right, right. You're not going to have a white man communicating to black men bringing them in. Right. That's just how reality is. That's how it works, yeah. Yeah, bro. It's, mm -hmm. and that's fine. That's normal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't get bent out of shape about things like that, you know? And I think a lot of black men, which I know it. Because, see, see, the content that I do is, like, I just do positive things, right? Mm -hmm. So the conversations and the dialogue and the comments that I get, I know what people are, what time people are on and what they want to be on. You right. know what I mean? And people want to be more into that benevolent energy. People want to, to just the positive things in life, the healthy things in life, the holistic mm -hmm. approach to life. People want that. They just need some guidance. Mm -hmm. And they got to hear from the right people. Right. You know? That's that matters, it. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting because I was thinking about that, like Squire, mm -hmm. and I was like, yo, black men need this right you know what i'm saying but it's just we're not we don't live in a time right now to where any white man or non-black is going to bring a substantial amount of blacks into that program sure. i don't see it happening right right you know what i'm saying yeah i yeah. get it but that it's makes just, sense first of all just, yeah it's exactly just, it's just, it's what it is yeah I didn't think you were going to have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. You had an answer for that. I already thought about sense. that. Okay, I, yeah, I observed yeah. it and I was telling my brothers about it. I'm like, yo, this is dope. Right, this is dope. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, awesome I was trying experience. to, it's interesting because I was trying to come up with a program mm -hmm. similar to what y'all are doing. I'm mm -hmm. like, yo, they're doing it. Like, right, for right. real. Yeah. And I was, I, bro, I even wrote out a whole curriculum for mm -hmm. like a rites of passage. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I was going to do a workshop uh, about masculinity. Yeah. You know what I mean? divine masculine like being tapped in with god and divinity mm -hmm. and love but being men right. masculine and my thing was like you know most men don't have any form of rites of passage you know mm -hmm. and i know me having my rites of passage was like i'm glad that i've had it's everything yeah it's everything. but i know a lot of men don't right and um and i feel like you don't have to be young to have a rites of passage definitely not you know never too late right so i was trying to come up with something for that but then when i seen what y'all were doing i was like i need to fuck with them <laughs> man that's that's fire that's yeah. fire look when i see greatness I, I recognize and look i'm gonna tell you something bedros is a great man mm -hmm. i respect that guy mm -hmm. you know i heard about him 
few years ago. Never knew. You know, I'm just like slow to like get to know people. Sure, yeah. yeah. I just be in my own little world. But um, one day I sat and like just checked them out. Cause look, I'm a skeptical person. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? So I'm looking at everybody's side eye. I'm like, right. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And he was super nice to me. Um, my boy Vince brought me down to the to the ranch mm -hmm. and I checked everything. I'm like, this is pretty dope. Mm -hmm. And Bezos was super cool, right? I'm like, I fucks with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like kind people and he seemed very genuine. And then I started digging into his content, like, yo, I like this guy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then just seeing the things that he's doing, like Squire is so incredible mm -hmm. it's dope yeah. you know and that's for all men whatever race but i just know reality mm -hmm. is people listen to their own own people right you know what i'm right. saying and that's fine right. look i take like my boy sean my business partner mm -hmm. like he's persian but he's looked at as a white guy right, right. but he's not he don't want to be called white <laughs> but i'm like you white bro. right right i, tell, I be telling <laughs> that, like you, you're, you're white you look right. white yeah but all my people embrace him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's how it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, so his people embrace me. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about, you know, crossing these these barriers and these lines confidently. A lot of people are not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I am, because I'm like, why not? Right. And life is, you gotta think, like, empires of old were greater when it was multiple cultures, like, integrating becoming something new and unique. Mm -hmm. That's why America is so great now because this is a melting pot of so many cultures. Right. It's such a weird mix of, right, right. of things. Right. And when you start traveling the world, everything is basic. Right. Mexico is Mexico. Germany is Germany. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not but the same. here, mm -hmm. it's fire. I love it here. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. I mean? And that's the goal, man. That's what we're trying to do with Squire, man. We want to have everybody come realize yeah. that this is a rite of passage experience for everybody, every culture, right. every background, every ethnicity, because it's just a beautiful thing that all men need to go through. You yeah. know, it's it's uh, it's needed. You know, I feel like this is, a, it's like a, it, not the, just the Squire program itself, but there's a movement of men wanting to become more masculine, mm -hmm. uh, not be so soft, you know, right. It, it, there's a pushback mm -hmm. and I think this is where it starts you know programs yeah, like this sure. and so it's an awesome experience so I'm glad that you'll be able to experience it with yeah. us and, 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 and teach the, the youth and the fathers some mm -hmm. things um, and just be able to experience it with us man so anyways Mike I appreciate you I gotta say once again much respect for you being here uh, we're all grateful this is a ton of value that you brought and so for anybody who wants to find you where can they find you? Just Mike Rashid across all platforms um, or my site sacredsociety.io Cool. Awesome. Yes, awesome. Sir. Awesome. Hey, look, I want to give you a lot of respect, too, because you carry yourself like a very mature, evolved man. You Thank know, you. when I was 27, I was not that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, I really appreciate you for who you are and you are a role model and just keep doing what you're doing. And you got your you're in incredible counsel with Bedros. Right. That's a blessing in itself. You know 100%. I mean? yeah. 100%. I'm grateful, man. Thanks for the kind words. I appreciate yes, that, Mike. All right, man. Like I said, much respect. Thanks. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, for guys, me. check out Mike Rashid and his different businesses uh, on YouTube, on IG, always dropping the fire content, the knowledge, and the wisdom. And so if you liked a little bit of this, this bite-sized chunk of, of, of his knowledge, go check him on other platforms, too. We appreciate you guys for tuning in with us. See you next time. Yeah.